Welcome back. Well, the foliage is turning really bright colors around here right now. Shadows have gotten longer early in the afternoon, and the sky is just starting to show that nice sign that means it's bird hunting season, huh, Benny? Benny over here. Hey, good boy. Yeah, I know. We killed a stink bug a minute ago, and he doesn't, uh, he doesn't care for those, so I don't blame him with his nose. Probably bugs him. But anyway, I wanted to talk about uh, things that are vital to the season. Uh, kind of put away the uh, tactical stuff for the time being and just talk about uh, the essence of hunting. And uh, on a practical level, I'd like to talk about some of the things that uh, I know that a, a bunch of you uh, are probably really longing to hear and to understand. When I go on the blogs and I, I read questions from people and I, and I see commentaries about various calibers and I, you know, it doesn't make any difference which cartridge we're talking about, but uh, there will always be somebody who will give uh, this one sage piece of advice. He says, it's all about bullet placement or something to that effect. You know, I could puke. If I read that comment one more time, it's all about bullet placement from somebody who doesn't explain what bullet placement means. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's about the most worthless answer there possibly is. Yes, it is about bullet placement. But if, if the poor guy at the, at the other end of the uh, line doesn't understand what it exactly you're talking about, pull it, placing it where? Uh, placing it, and then you'll hear somebody, uh, you'll read somebody else will comment that, oh, I always, I always shoot my deer in the neck. Oh, I always, I always shoot him in the brain. Uh, I always shoot him uh, through, the, through the heart. I always shoot him through the lungs. I always shoot him this way or that way or the other thing. And, uh, you know, just like so many other things I read online, it's, it's all a bunch of worthless drivel unless somebody with some understanding of what bullets do and how they should do it. Uh, is able to give some uh, vital explanations, a, a comprehensive uh, and, and a comprehensible uh, explanation. Yes, it is about bullet placement. Well, we're talking about the anatomy of a game animal here, and let's put aside varmints. Varmints are, for the most part, very easy to kill. Even, uh, even wily coyote is not uh, much of a match for virtually any caliber uh, with a center fire cartridge. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple to put down any varmint. And with the shock factor involved, with the uh, tremendous, tremendous hydraulic shock factor involved with high velocity bullets that are hitting uh, sometimes the terminal velocities that are still in excess of 3,000 feet per second downrange, uh, then that's really, that's really a no-brainer. That, that uh, woodchuck or prairie dog or whatever is reduced to uh, uh, basically helplessness uh, in an instant and is, and is out cold and dead. But we're talking about game animals, something that uh, is, you know, something on the order of a 100-pound-plus animal. It's a different story here. Bullets uh, cause a different rea reaction uh, depending upon their uh, size and velocity. Just a second. Benny, got a boy over here. Got a boy. Come on. I know that old stink bug. Um, when I when I talk about when I talk about uh, how bullets should be placed. I want to discuss first of all the anatomy of uh, the game that we're seeking and why it is that bullets should be placed where they are placed uh, and what, what it is that we're seeking to cause. Yes, we're, ca we're seeking to cause the demise of the animal as quickly as possible and basically uh, render him first to uh, either at, at least utter helplessness or to put his lights out right away uh, with a humane kill. And that's really the, that's really the essence of a good sport, sportsman-like uh, hunt. Now there are some very bad, uh, there are very some very very bad commentaries about um, hunting online and uh, I've even seen some very bad commentaries about hunting uh, in, writ in written publications. <clears throat> I will say that uh, those individuals who have uh, you know been broadly recognized as um, having hunted a field 
for a great number of years. They know what they're talking about, and they're not talking, they're not talking off the top of their head. They, they're doing this, they're, they're giving their advice intelligently and with an understanding from uh, the experience that they bring with them. Um, one of the um, one of the first things I want to talk about is the bullet performance, the terminal performance of a bullet on a uh, game. This is something which is really um, broadly misunderstood and uh, what, what bullet makers, bullet manufacturers uh, with their knowledge, and remember bullet, bullet manufacturers don't make bullets in a vacuum. Usually uh, the, the heads of those corporations that make these bullets, whether it's Hornady or Nosler or Sierra or whomever, uh, these people, these people are experienced hunters. These people have gone afield uh, for a combined total of uh, sometimes well over a hundred years, uh, and they know what they're talking about, and they know exactly what type of performance they should build into a bullet. And when they recommend specific bullets for particular uses, they know what they're talking about. And I think we're going a little bit far afield and taking it upon ourselves when we start to. Uh, you know, suggest to uh, ourselves or to others especially that we should deviate from that norm. You know, we're, we're in a free society in, in America and we can do the things we want, but it's, it, it is, it is uh, intellectually irresponsible for, to just drift uh, into, into regions unknown uh, simply because of uh, some, you know, small degree of experience that somebody may uh, carry a field which gives them some particular uh, once in a while you know you'll have you have a, a, an instance where a uh, bullet will perform uh, in a manner which is out of its class so I'm speaking first of all about let's talk about penetration of a bullet big game bullets are designed to penetrate and to expand to penetrate and expand and uh, the degree to which they penetrate should be full and utterly through the broad side of an animal. Uh, it should be through and through. Now let me explain this before somebody uh, turns off their computer or, or pipes in that you know you need to have a bullet anchor itself inside the chest and all that. Well I'm going to say something that I've said before. I'm going to repeat it once again. Bullets don't there's no, there's no such thing as a bullet killing by energy. Bullets are not something which throw an animal to the ground, despite uh, what may be uh, illustrated in Hollywood and things like that. The energy factor is what drives the bullet through the beast. That's what the, that's what the energy does. And as the diameter of the bullet goes up, then the energy that's required to push it through the same distance through uh, flesh and bone uh, has to also uh, be elevated. That's where the energy factor comes through, is its ability to penetrate with uh, the, the desired effect through the animal with the diameter and weight of the bullet. All those things are mathematical, but it's not the, the energy does not kill an animal. You can, you can hit that animal as hard as you want with a, with a brick. That's a lot of energy. It's not going to phase him. That's not what kills the animal. <clears throat> what's, what's necessary, essentially, in uh, logical terms, is for a bullet to penetrate through and through. The reason why it should penetrate through and through will make sense to any of you who have been in the military who went through uh, basic training or, or boot camp. You learned about what's called a sucking chest wound. A sucking chest wound is something which is very, very dangerous to a wounded soldier on the ground because a sucking chest wound means that if that, if that cavity in the, chest, in the chest wall is not sealed up, then air immediately rushes in and neutralizes the, uh, neutralizes the natural vacuum which is uh, around the lungs which keep them expanded. Your lungs exist in a, uh, basically in a vacuum chamber. They exist in a, in, a, in a realm where the lungs can expand and contract because your diaphragm is lifting up and down. Your diaphragm as it lifts up and down changes that vacuum within 
within the changes the dimension within the uh, thorax and it causes the the lungs to compress and expand it's it's not it's not because you are breathing in you breathe in because your diaphragm is pulling down that's how you breathe you don't your lungs are not muscle tissue because uh, they don't they don't expand on their own they expand because they they billow out as the diaphragm drops down and creates a greater suction greater a vacuum within the thorax. Well, if you pierce both sides, if you pierce that thorax region sufficiently large, uh, it will cause a depletion of that vacuum which cannot be recharged with the diaphragm. Let me explain more fully. As a bullet penetrates through the first, through the first wall of the chest, that bullet is piercing uh, at, a, at a diameter which is essentially equal to its own bore size. So in other words, if, you, if you're shooting a 30 caliber bullet, the bullet pierces through at 30 caliber and uh, the, the, the chest wall tissue can actually close, close up. It's a muscular tissue that, and, and fat that can actually close up around that wound and it can, uh, it can essentially uh, reinvigorate that uh, basically keep that chest wall uh, active so that the animal can still breathe. Now you may have, the bullet may have gone in and it may have uh, shattered some of the lung tissue, but you know there are two lungs in there and unless both lungs are completely depleted, uh, the animal can still breathe sufficiently to run quite a ways. Now in a sucking chest wound, the other side of the chest wall, uh, as the bullet penetrates and exits. That, that bullet is now fully expanded and not only is it penetrating with the expansion of its own uh, bullet physical mass, but it's also, cre it's also blowing out and it's, and it's causing a, uh, it causes a much larger wound than it originally, uh, than it originally was uh, in, in its mushroom form. So it's not uncommon for a 308 bullet to uh, expand to a diameter which is well in excess of 45 caliber, but then when it, when it exits on the other side, due to that energy, due to the energy now, because of the energy and the expansion, the, the violence of the, the velocity, then because of that energy, it can, it can blow out the other side of the chest wall and it can create a much larger wound cavity, which is maybe as much as a, an inch and a half to two inches, which is maybe 60 to 200 percent larger than the actual mushroom bullet size. Now what this does is immediately it causes the collapsing of both lungs. So irrespective of the fact that the bullet did not necessarily, it doesn't have to disintegrate both lungs as it goes through. What it does though is it completely collapses them. Both, both lungs completely collapse because they neutralize with the air pressure rushing in from the outside. You've heard, you've probably read where uh, people like Jack O'Connor would uh, years ago would recommend that you, you want to get, you want to get fresh air rushing into that chest wall cavity. Well, that's why he's, ta he's talking not in terms of what uh, physicians know about and in emergency room surgeons know about, which is the sucking chest wound. That's what he's talking about. It's that evacuation, it's that evacuation of that natural uh, vacuum which exists within the thorax, which is neutralized by the outside air pressure, and the lungs basically just collapse. That's what's called a collapsed lung. When both lungs collapse, the animal simply can't run anymore. He can't take another couple of steps because he just simply, he, he can't draw the air that's necessary to propel him. Um, and what about, what about then uh, bullets? You'll say that, well, there are, there are varmint bullets, which you know from experience, your own experience, that will go in and destroy the lung tissue. Well, they're essentially doing the same thing. They're, they're collapsing the lung tissue. So I still don't recommend those because varmint bullets were designed for one express purpose and that was to, to disintegrate uh, virtually on impact with the ground and upon uh, very small lightweight varmints. Varmints which have a diameter of no more than a couple, you know, maybe the size of your fist and that's, they're, they're expanded fully by the time they get halfway through a squirrel. That's the type of that's the type of expansion which can be very very iffy with a large 
uh, big game animals such as a deer. Um, it's it's fine. It's fine on uh, you know a lightly constructed coyote. Uh, it's certainly fine for woodchucks or any other kind of vermin. But when you're talking about a deer that weighs 90 to 100 pounds or 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 a uh, antelope, you're talking about a game animal which uh, has got a rib cage which can cause that bullet to utterly come apart at the seams before it gets very deep. And if that only gets if that only gets into one of the one of the lungs and only blows up uh, uh, one lobe of both lungs, that animal can run a long ways, and that animal can actually literally survive for a, for quite a long time uh, and escape. <coughs> Okay, so that's why I say you really need to have a, a bullet which expands through and through. The other reason why, now that's the physiological reason with regards to the deer's anatomy. You want to have it go through the lung cavity and, and cause the collapse of those lungs and his, uh, complete, uh, you know, his complete exhaustion immediately. Uh, the other thing is too that even if it does not cause immediately, uh, immediately the collapse of the animal, it will, however, uh, leave a fabulous blood trail, something that you can follow uh, to the terminus, something where the animal is going to be dead at the other end of the blood trail. And that's, a, that's essential to uh, tracking an animal. Um, I shot an elk one time that uh, with my 300 Winchester Magnum with a 200 grain nozzle protection bullet at a slight angle. Uh, the bullet had to go, the, the bullet had to go in through the back of his rib cage and it lodged uh, behind his shoulder blade, which was pr beautiful performance for the bullet. Uh, it went through, it went through bo both uh, lungs and uh, it caused, it, it causes death, um, but it did not collapse his lungs because it didn't exit the other side. And it didn't leave a blood trail because it left one drop of blood. In fact, the, the, um, the blood trail was just about the size of a, a quarter, and it was exactly, just about exactly where the uh, elk was when I struck him. So in other words, that one spurt of blood dropped out and landed on the grass, and that was it. And there was no other blood trail. Now, he went about 60 yards, and he went down to his knees, and then finally he collapsed, and he spent about the next three minutes uh, breathing his last as I waited, and that's another thing too. You should we'll, we'll talk about this more as the correct conduct, what you should do when you put an animal, put a bullet through an animal. Uh, I knew he was down; there was no question about it. So I didn't, I didn't fire again, and I was, I was fully prepared to fire another round. Um, but the, the, the thing you don't want to do is immediately hop on your horse and start, you know, running after that uh, elk, because that will basically frighten him up to. Uh, his feet, and he can he can go a long ways under those circumstances. So he basically peacefully just uh, you know uh, went to sleep. But uh, Benny here, good boy, good boy. I know that old stink bug. Um, but that was an example uh, of both sorts. Uh, the the uh, the lung tissue uh, the lung tissue was greatly destroyed. Uh, two lobes of uh, you know the, this. Uh, a lot of lung tissue in a in a uh, elk, and uh, there was a lot of destruction of the lungs, and it caused them to uh, go down, um, and and it certainly killed them without any difficulty. But the problem the problem was that uh, had that been had that been an animal that was uh, able to you know keep on running, I would have had to put another bullet through him, hopefully through through and through, uh, in order to uh, anchor him. But you don't want to. You don't want to have uh, you know a failure of a bullet with regard to its uh, penetration. You want it. You want it to penetrate through and through. There's no anchoring effect to a bullet. A bullets don't anchor anything. Uh, that's something which was developed in my uh, in in my day during uh, the 70s when we were doing some extensive testing with. Uh, police ammunition with uh, you know the the ammunition that police carried, and you can watch my discussion on uh, the choice of uh, handgun cartridges for uh, self-defense and things, and I explain this fully, but, uh, you know, handguns work with a minimal amount of energy, uh, and, and what, was, what was being uh, sought was a, a bullet which did not go all the way through, which some people thought that we were trying to anchor the bullet and therefore anchor the assailant. We weren't trying to anchor the assailant. We were trying to stop the bullet from going all the way through because the bullet that goes all the way through could hit an innocent bystander. In other words, there was a there was a threat 
to uh, innocent life, uh, you know, if that bullet continued on through, which is what, which is what bullets used to do years ago uh, when I first went on the police department in the early 70s. Uh, so you had, to, you had to have a bullet which stayed in, but it was not for its anchoring effect. There's no anchoring effect to a bullet. Um, it's it's not, it, not that at all. We, we desired to have a bullet that did an awful lot of internal damage and mushroom so that it did not go all the way through. And we were looking actually for less sectional density. Uh, bullets that had less sectional density than, than the, the classic 158 grain lead bullet, which was long and slender and could pass through. So we started ending up with bullets such as 125 and in some cases even 110 grain uh, bullets, which would, uh, you know, halt before they uh, emerged on the other side and, and threatened, uh, you know, innocent life. So that's the penetration aspect. Secondly, we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about what's the correct target. Well, I think I've already alluded to that, which is the lungs. I've seen an awful lot of I've, uh, ridiculous commentaries about uh, people shooting, you know, deer in the neck. Um, Here's an example right here. This is, this is a vacuum cleaner hose. Uh, this is just about identical to the size of a uh, deer's neck. And I would say that that right there is just about the size, that's just about the size of the deer's neck right there as he's feeding and he's lifting his head up and feeding and lifting his head up and then turning. And well, if you're at, if you're at 35 or 40 yards away and you're aiming at something that's undulating and that's a living that's living and you're aiming at this pal I'm sorry but I don't I'm not in that camp uh, that's that's not where I live and breathe and this is about the size of his brain right here this is it's about the size of it's about the size of a teacup and that 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 part of the vacuum cleaner hose that's about the size of his brain and I don't want to be shooting at his brain either. Well, you're going to say, well, so what if I miss? I miss. Well, you don't. Because, you know, this, this part of the, this, this spine is in the upper side of uh, the neck, which is essentially about 300% uh, to 600% larger than this hose. It's hidden within. Um, and if you, and if you happen to, if you happen to place your bullet underneath that, uh, there's a very, very strong chance that you're going to uh, perforate his uh, esophagus, so you're not going to be able to eat anymore. You're not going to kill him right away. In fact, he'll live for an awful long time. Uh, he'll live for days with a perforated esophagus. Uh, and you could perforate his trachea. So now he's, now he's breathing through a hole in his uh, neck. And he's eventually, uh, you know, he's going he's gonna to have a pretty difficult time living out that situation but in either case are you going to own that animal that animal is not yours to keep because that animal is now out in the, in the highlands someplace uh, or in the swamps and he's going to he's going to live out the rest of his days wounded grossly um, and uh, there's a there's a slim chance remember you know the 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 vital the, the vital vein and uh, the artery that runs through the neck is not as big as you think it is. It's only about the size of my finger, and it's pretty elastic. And bullet can pass right beside that without without harming either. So he's not necessarily going to die uh, by bleeding out either. The rest of the tissue is is a bulk of muscle tissue. Muscle tissue, my friend, is called meat. That's what you put on the dinner table and eat. Um, you know, people will ask you when you go to bring your deer to the butcher, you know, the butcher will ask, what, what do you want me to do with the neck roast? That's what it's called. It's called a neck roast. Do you want to have it cut up into hamburg or do you want to have it, do you want to have it uh, made into a, deboned and made into a roast and tied up with, uh, tied up with butcher string? So, you know, it's, it's even silly beyond comprehension that somebody wants to put a bullet through uh, a neck roast. When you go through the thorax, when you go through the uh, rib cage section, you know, feel yourself. That's, I mean, you know, there's, there's not, there's, I feel ribs there. There's, 
there's nothing there. There's uh, on, on the hide of a deer, you've got, you've got his hair, you've got his hide, which is, you know, less than an eighth of an inch thick, uh, a sixteenth of an inch thick. Then you have a, a little bit of muscle tissue, and then you have ribs, then you have a little bit of uh, underlaying muscle tissue, and then you have, the, then you have that uh, silvery uh, membrane on the inside which seals his thorax, seals those lungs in and makes it a watertight and airtight compartment. So, uh, but there's no meat there. So, you know, when you drive a bullet through both sides of the, both sides of the lungs and through, through both sides of his rib cage, you're not destroying any meat. You're destroying at most maybe a couple of ounces of hamburger meat, and that's about it. Uh, so shooting him through the neck is not only irresponsible and can cause uh, the loss of a precious animal, but it's also, it's also very wasteful. And for anybody who thinks that they can, you know, take, uh, take aim, at the small brain of a, uh, a deer. A deer's brain is, that's the size of it, it's about the size of a teacup. And, you know, as he turns, animal, if you ever watch a deer for, for just a couple of minutes, you'll see how they move, they, they dart. And they do it unexpectedly. They don't, they don't lazily turn their head like a llama. They're, they're, they're nervous, fidgety creatures. There are many pro problems associated with shooting a deer in the head. First of all, it's ugly and stupid. Um, in in our area, we have we have you know mom and pop uh, grocery stores and general stores and gas stations that do all the game checking. Uh, they are the ones that weigh the animal and they are the other ones that uh, you know uh, fill out the fill out the necessary paperwork to register your your, your uh, game that you took and everything. They don't want to see that crap, you know, being dragged onto their property with eyeballs hanging out and some grotesque, you know, bl you know blown out, uh, you know, cranium. They don't want to see that. You know, you're likely to never be very welcome on their property again. Secondly, if you blow those antlers off, if you, you know, most, most states do not define deer by sex. They define deer as antlered and antlerless. Well, if you blow, if you happen to blow the antlers off of your deer, uh, there's no way for them to tell. In many states, you now own, you now possess uh, an illegally taken uh, deer because they, you cannot, you cannot prove that you had an antlered or an antlerless deer in those areas where it's required to do so. Uh, and you can't, you can't just simply say, well, these are the antlers that went with it. Sorry, that doesn't work that way. They got to be attached. That's the way the, that's the way the game laws work. So it's a stupid, idiotic thing to do to take pot shots at a deer's little brain. It, um, and another reason is to uh, the wounding. The wounding possibilities are enormous. You know, if you if you if you blow his nose off, if you if you drive a bullet through his snout and blow his nose off, he's not eating anymore. Uh, he can't. You know, he's going to die a hideous death very soon. Uh, I know personally of, uh, of a hunter, an idiotic hunter that was up in Quebec quite a number of years ago that uh, thought he would amaze and stupefy his friends by, uh, he said, watch this, he's going to shoot his moose, Quebec, beautiful Quebec moose, he's going to shoot the moose, it was a cow, so he's going to shoot her saving meat, you know, on the pretense of saving meat, he was going to shoot her in the head. Well, he did already, he shot her in the head, blew the, blew the uh, jawbone off. So now you had this hideous mess of a uh, cow moose, beautiful cow moose, uh, with without a lower jaw. You know, um, they had to they had to hunt for somebody else was able to at least put a winging shot into that uh, moose before it got too far off into the pucker brush, and they were able to after several hours of hunting it down, they were able to find where the moose was and they saved it. Otherwise, that guy was probably going to go to jail up in, uh, in Quebec because, you know, that was, that was, uh, he, he was required to take that moose and basically what he did was a reckless, a reckless act according to their statutes up there. Uh, you, you know, we, we're held responsible for, you know, our ethical behavior in the field and that's not something that you want to do. You don't want to be, you don't want to be amazing your friends with your active, you know, uh, shooting prowess by uh, doing things like that that are stupid. Save, save that stuff for, you know, 
lighting matches with your 22 at 20 paces or something like that, or shoot, shoot apples off a of fence post and, and you know, stun your friends with your amazing skill in those situations. But leave that stuff home when it comes to you know, shooting game in the field. So those are the, that's the, that's the aspect of uh, what we should be aiming at. We should be aiming at the lungs. Now I haven't brought up heart shots. The heart, the heart is a, that's obviously if you, if you penetrate the heart, uh, that animal is going to die soon. But it's not, it's not the most recommended, uh, anybody who has any knowledge of hunting a field knows that it's not the recommended target. Because first of all, it lays very low in the chest and it can be, it's very easy to miss. Uh, it's easy to shoot low uh, by an inch or two and completely miss it. The other problem is, is believe it or not, uh, a, a deer or an elk shot through the heart is almost like putting adrenaline into their system. They can, they can sprint for a long way. Uh, a friend of mine, I think I mentioned this one other time, uh, a friend of mine many years ago uh, shot a deer here in New Hampshire in a cornfield uh, towards the end, of, the end of the evening, toward the end of uh, the day, just, just before dusk. And uh, he shot a beautiful large doe uh, with his 306 with 100, 180 grain power point uh, uh, bullets. And it shattered the heart. Uh, the, uh, the deer ran down the, the corn row, uh, spraying blood uh, two, two widths of corn wide all the way down. 300 yards almost that deer ran before it finally collapsed in a heap. Now, that just goes to show you, I mean, the deer was dead on his feet, but it was not, it was not down because uh, the, the, heart, the heart is one of those uh, unusual shots which can cause a deer to run an awful long way. So it's not the, it's not the quickest kill of all. The quickest kill of all is, is actually a shot through the lungs. A shot through the lungs is the best way. Now, <clears throat> you sometimes hear people say when they ask, What's the, best, what's the best place to hold on a deer, for instance, or uh, an elk or whatever? And, you know, I, the reason why I don't talk too much about elk is that, for the most part, anybody, by the time they're hunting elk, they, they probably already hunted, uh, they probably already hunted deer. Um, you'll sometimes hear people say, well, they, they always hold just, just behind the crease of the, just behind the, the crease of the foreleg or something like that, you know. Well, it depends. If, if, that, if that deer is broadside, you know, and he's in that Hollywood posture, you know, just a beautiful 90 degree, 90 degree posture right beside you, yeah, you could, that's, that's, the, ideal, that's the ideal placement for your crosshairs or your, or your post front sight or whatever it is or your red dot. That's the ideal thing. But if he happens to be angled uh, so that he's uh, angling away from you. That's not the. That's not the best shot. That's not the best shot because now uh, you're just simply clipping him through the shoulder, and that can be a wounding shot, which the the deer can the deer can survive uh, for literally for weeks with a, uh, a clipped wing like that. So you don't want to just you don't want to just you know put a bullet through the shoulder. You, if you if you if you happen to go in through the back of the uh, the back of the leg uh, and he's angling away, it's going to come out here high in the chest and it's not going to it's not going to have the effect that you want of going through the lungs. So it depends on the angle. What you've got to do then is is keep moving your crosshairs back, farther back to basically keep those crosshairs aiming toward the center of the lungs. Remember the position of those lungs will change. Uh, what, what you can do is get yourself a, uh, I, I wish I had a, a illustrating model. Benny, come here. Atta boy. Here's a model right here. And we're not gonna be, we're not gonna be taking shots at you, that's for sure. But you know, you have to, you have to remember that his, that his chest cavity changes position as he changes position. And so that's where you have to you have to angle your shot. Right now, looking at the camera, the center of his the center of his chest is now off center on his chest. It's not always in the center, and if he's standing up, it's not necessarily going to be uh, in the same place either. So, uh, you know, you always have to you always have to imagine. Think of it as a uh, you know a volleyball that's located within the chest cavity of uh, of a deer, and as the deer turns 
you're always aiming for the center of that volleyball. So just imagine in your head that that volleyball changes and as the angle, as the angle of the uh, deer faces up. Get him, baby. Get him, boy. Stand. Get him, boy. If he's facing in this direction, now the chest cavity is behind here. So you, you're always angling your shots. You're, you're always angling your shots in relation to the uh, position of the lungs. So that's really about all I want to cover today is uh, shot placement and uh, bullet construction. Uh, I did speak about bullet construction, I think, in, in choosing uh, pro appropriate bullets. But for the most part, you know, you can, you can follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Um, a, bullet that, a bullet that penetrates through and through is not carrying energy out to the other side that's going to waste. It's not, it doesn't work that way. It, please, it does not work that way. You want to penetrate through both sides of the chest cavity in order to open up that chest to the air to collapse the lungs. That's what's necessary. Uh, the bullet itself doesn't have any anchoring effect. It doesn't do that. And, and whatever anchoring effect it has, the deer is going to get up and he's going to run with because it, it's not it's not something that's uh, it's not something that causes a debilitating uh, condition to the animal. What causes a debilitating condition is the collapsing of the lungs, where he can no longer breathe. And when an animal can no longer breathe, the pain is extreme, and he just simply stops running. And that's and that's what happens. And also, too, physiologically, it does not reincorporate the um, blood with oxygen, and so you know the brain starves for a lack of uh, lack of nourishment and and dies. So these are all the important things to remember. Select a bullet that's good construction. Don't minimize when it comes to uh, bullet weight simply for the sake of velocity. That's very often done. Um, you know, I, I've spoken very many times about uh, impact velocity and the importance that I feel is uh, I like to keep impact velocity below uh, 3,000 feet per second on game animals. And when I say below 3,000 feet per second, it's perfectly all right if the impact velocity drops down to 23, 24, 2,500 feet per second. That's absolutely fine. Uh, impact velocity is not necessary for for humane kills. Uh, you know the the 458 Winchester Magnum, which takes uh, a, you know African uh, dangerous game, you know lions and things like that 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 are carniv carnivorous and, and attack and growl and, and chew people up and everything. Uh, that that bullet's only moving along at 21 to 2200 feet per second from the muzzle. And by the time it gets not very far down range, it's descended below 2000 feet per second. So. Impact velocity is not necessary for uh, quick, humane kills. What is necessary is a big, big, huge frontal area, and that's what that bullet does. That, that bullet, that 458 Winchester Magnum bullet, unless you've got a soft point, most of those bullets are hard cased, uh, you know, steel cased jackets with a copper, uh, copper plating on the outside that do not expand. Uh, they, 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 come out, they come out the other side, uh, they could be reloaded again for the most part, except for the rifling on them. High impact velocities can cause stunning effect on on game animals. Uh, you know, it can it can certainly cause it can certainly cause that lights out effect where the animal just simply drops right there because of the there's a shock value involved, which is not is not the physiological shock that we uh, talk about when we say that um, you know a person has suffered shock has gone into shock or something like that because they they got an electrical uh, impulse through their system or they uh, they got struck by an automobile or something that's not the shock I'm talking about I'm talking about a shock wave effect which is the uh, physical uh, movement of body fluids rapidly through the system which uh, cause it literally can cause uh, the the heart and uh, the, the heart and central nervous system to collapse because of that shock wave but that's a different sort of thing and that can occur with generally speaking with velocities that are uh, impact velocities that are in excess of about 2600 feet per second which most most of your uh, you know popular big game uh, rifles 
uh, are capable of impact velocities within standard ranges of, of 2,600 and, uh, more feet per second. But they don't have to be that high. The 300, the 300 Savage for many years only exited the muscle at uh, 2660. And by the time it struck most deer, it was only doing barely 2600, if that. Uh, it probably, in most cases, it had descended to velocities that were closer to 2450 or 2400 feet per second. So it's not necessary, and, they, and they, it was a very, very rapid killer of deer. Uh, and with this 150 grain bullet that was most commonly used, it penetrated through and through ventilated the chest cavity very quickly and the animal died uh, without much expired very quickly. And that's why a 3030 with a 170 grain bullet uh, is very effective because it goes right on through and it has good expansion, it's got a good bullet diameter to begin with uh, and, it, and it, causes that, it causes that collapse of the lungs which I've spoken about. Um, so these are all important. When you get v impact velocities above 3,000 feet per second, then what you start getting is extraordinary, uh, you know, meat damage. Meat damage. Meat damage which can go beyond the region uh, that's necessary to uh, kill the animal. In other words, the shock wave effect is so, is so violent that it causes massive bruising and that, you know, you, you can't eat bruised meat. That becomes gelatinous and it's very ugly meat. It's, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, tissue is not edible. So the, the butcher will uh, quietly throw that away. When you come back to get your animal, he'll just simply, you know, give you your meat and you say, gee, I, I thought, boy, I thought he weighed more than that. And he'll say, well, yeah, I had to throw away a bunch of meat in the, you know, he'll show you the trash pile so you don't think that he brought it to his buddy to eat that night. But that's what happens. You'll, you know, you'll get, you'll get a lot of bruising with uh, unnecessary bruising that will go beyond uh, the impact point. So you may have struck him perfectly in the chest cavity, but the bruising will uh, go beyond that and will start to, uh, you know, go out into the, the meat, into the meaty area of the, the shoulders and up in the, uh, up in the sirloin region, the chops and things like that, which, you know, ruins some awful, uh, awful good meat. Uh, and if that bullet is high in the spine, uh, you know, you could, you could easily cause, you know, you could easily cause the whole section of his spine, which is the best meat uh, in the deer, along with the, along with the, the, um, uh, the, the strips that are on the, uh, on the inside of the uh, chest cavity, which are, that's, that's your tenderloins, you know, so you really don't want to, you really don't want to have, uh, it's not necessary to have, uh, you know, extraordinarily high um, exit velocities when you're hunting. Think in these terms. If you're if you're a plains game hunter, uh, you know classically speaking, the the 270 was always just about perfect because it exited the muzzle at over 3,100 feet per second, and anything that was downrange at at uh, 150 to 200 yards away, uh, that bullet was impacting at just the right velocity, around 2,800 feet per second, perhaps when it struck and it caused that it caused that immediate uh, cessation of life uh, and it was a very very capable killer uh, and likewise you know uh, cartridges like the 280 Remington that started out at, at 2900 or 300 3000 feet per second or so you know they were also impacting at 24 2500 feet per second or more uh, so that's 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 the nice that's the nice region of speed for uh, for long range planes hunting but that's not necessarily the speed that you want to be uh, looking at when you go winding out, going out into these woods here where you're going to be encountering deer, you know, 30 paces away. Uh, in those situ situations, you really want to have a cartridge which is uh, operating from the muzzle, from the muzzle velocity, somewhere between 26 to 28, 2900 tops. You know, so you're, ta you're talking... That's why the 308 has become so popular. That's why that's why the uh, cartridges in that in that whole family of um, cartridges have have become so popular. Because for woods hunters, they just don't destroy that much meat. They put the game down quickly, and you don't need to have superformance, you know, velocities. That's that's not necessary. Getting getting cartridges up into the you know 3,000 foot per second. Uh, region for for woods hunting is really not necessary and it's and it's utterly uh, destructive to uh, meat tissue. So try to try to establish you know 
look at your look at your ballistic charts that go along with the ammunition that you buy and pick your bullets out accordingly you know they're usually now they're very they're usually very descriptive they'll tell you exactly what bullets are appropriate for certain game and uh, what bullets are not appropriate for a certain game if it's listing a bullet for varmints please don't use it on deer and on on uh, elk, elk and antelope and stuff like that because it's entirely inappropriate don't go outside the norms you know these norms have been established by people that know what they're talking about it's a very very it's a very very well established science that has been going on for a long long time people have been using firearms and especially center fire firearms on uh, game animals for now for many generations so they know what they're talking about they know what bullets work and that's why they were developed for those reasons you don't need to have a bullet which is highly frangible to uh, take game. You want to have a bullet that essentially stays together in one piece. So you don't want to have it. You don't want to have it flying apart at the seams like a varmint bullet is intended to do. Uh, and that's and that's because the varmint is a small animal. They had to you had to upset the bullet in a hurry in order for it to do exactly what it was intended to do, which is to expand. And secondarily, so that the bullet would uh, come apart on impact with the ground and not uh, not be ricocheting across a meadow. Um, and you don't, as far as deer go, you don't have to you don't have to pick a bullet which has uh, superior, uh, you know, one of these extremely high priced bullets with A frames or petitions or bonded cores and all that stuff. It's really not necessary. Uh, you know, a, a simple a simple jacketed soft point bullet uh, made by one of your reputable manufacturers is, is absolutely more than enough. You know, the 100 per box variety is is ample for deer. When I say ample, I'm talking about like way beyond ample. So any of your standard Sierra Pro Hunters or your, your you know, Game Kings, uh, the Hornady Interlock is a beautiful bullet. Um, the standard, the standard uh, Nosler uh, bullets not the non you don't need a you don't need a petition bullet for uh, deer with the exception of perhaps you know the the six millimeter or uh, you know 25 caliber bullets I, I'd, I'd maybe get a petition bullet for for my 257 Roberts because it's just a it's just a smaller diameter uh, caliber to begin with um, and you in order to in order to get that in order to get that uh, that penetration and uh, you know expansion is necessary. You know, a, st a, str a strongly constructed, stoutly constructed bullet for a, a small diameter bore is not a bad idea. But it's really, it's you know, the game, the game bullet manufacturers again, they know what they're dealing with and they know what they're they know what they're putting out there. So they make their bullets, uh, you know, s strongly constructed for the for the game that uh, is being sought. Um, and don't push bullets beyond their uh, capability. Uh, don't don't cause a, you know don't don't try to have uh, a bullet do something that it just simply is not made to do. Um, I'm not going to talk about I'm not talking about uh, what ranges to hunt with uh, your your rifle. I'll deal with that in a, a second uh, second issue uh, later on. So thanks for watching and. Uh, Get out and do some hunting pretty soon. Right now, Benny and I, I think tomorrow morning, we're just going to grab a shotgun and we're going to get out and uh, do, some, do some partridge hunting. And uh, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Tell your friends about us. God bless.